Well, welcome everybody to this warm synod room in, in, in the middle of spring. We normally give warm welcome in the middle of December, but, but we're still always glad to see so many attend our inaugural lectures. And of course, uh, to see not only the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here today, but to see all the faculty represented and many, many guests from outside with us, including members of the University Council and Regents. Uh, Special evening, of course, for us because uh, Professor Van der Waal precedes my own time at the university. I came in 2003 and he came much earlier than that. And he's seen the university change over the years, much longer than I have. And I've been here 14 years already. The, it's special, therefore, to see a colleague um, who served the university for many years, many decades, actually um, be awarded a chair in his field made possible by a special partnership with the Everton Football Club. Everton Football Club, as you know, is one of our two um, well-known international clubs in the city, and Everton and the university have struck up a special relationship, largely through the agency of Professor Dennis Baxendale and the various members of, of her board that we've been working with. It's very special because Everton, as you know, is one of the leading clubs in terms of getting engaged with communities. And Everton has a very proud history as a football club of investing in its community. And its foundation is really an exemplar for many other football clubs in this country. Out of that relationship came a special endowment that made a chair in um, corporate social responsibility or as the club not wishing to emphasize corporate, um, but social responsibility. So it's a very special celebration tonight, not only of the relationship with the football club, but certainly with the uh, affirmation of this important theme in the, in the mission and values of our university, which is social responsibility. This university, as you know, goes back to 1844 and 1856, our two founding colleges in Victorian England, and uh, these colleges were established long before the Red Brick Universities were established in England, and they were established here to try to live out our special commitment to those who are disadvantaged for many, many centuries. The Education Reform Bill only brings for the first time in 1832 into the consciousness of us in England the fact that working class families were excluded from education. So at the very heart of this university, its DNA, has this sense of social responsibility. And whatever else we can become in the future as we develop our research and international standing, social responsibility is always part of what this university will remain committed to. And so here's a happy uh, celebration tonight of one of our senior colleagues getting the chain social responsibility, and Dr. Van der Waal's lecture this evening marks a very important part of what we mean by commitment to the public good. As is our custom, uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor will introduce our speaker, and I look forward to hearing our own professor profess uh, this, whole, this important theme of, theme of social responsibility. Now, among the very important people here tonight, of course, is the professor's wife. I haven't got to meet her yet, Linda, in the audience somewhere. But a special welcome to you, Linda. I'm sure this is a family celebration as well. And to your daughter, Dr. Sarah, um, who used to be Sarah Van der Waal. I'm not sure what the new surname is. <laughs> but you're very welcome, Sarah. Uh, we've heard much of your own progress to academia. And delighted that you could join us. And so, um, without much ado, Professor Kenneth Newport, Pro, Vi Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, will introduce our speaker. Colleagues and distinguished guests, this evening, Professor Ian van der Waal, a long-serving member of the Hope community, formally takes up his new role as Everton Chair of Social Responsibility. And as the Vice-Chancellor has said, there could, 
surely not be a more appropriate chair to be here at Liverpool Hope. For social responsibility, be that corporate, community or individual, is surely at the heart of the university's ethos. Back in the 18th century, it was John Wesley who said, there is no holiness but social, as he spurred on his new movement to go out and promote the common good in very practical and real ways. Most often, of course, this was within the context of new centers of urban life, which had been spawned by the Industrial Revolution. And amid all the social problems and the inequities that, that brought, I like to think, and I firmly believe, that here at Hope, Wesley's vision of seeking social justice, equity, and inclusion lives on. And it's good that Everton Football Club and Liverpool Hope University have come together in this way to work together to turn a shared sense of responsibility into practical and effective reality. And so to our lecturer, after completing studies in biosciences, including a PhD in amino acid metabolism, Professor van der Waale started his career as a secondary school teacher in Felixstowe in Suffolk, where he rose to the position of head of biology. And three years later, he moved to Dunstable College as head of chemistry. After those three years, he joined the university here, Liverpool Hope, first as a senior lecturer in sciences, and then in 1991 as deputy head of department. But during this time, Professor van der Waale led the development of the masters in environmental management, and at the same time was successful in accessing European funding in support of the development of wider postgraduate skills. In the following year, he brought in some further European funding and in 1996 was appointed Managing Director of Liverpool Hope Enterprises Limited. For the next several years, he was responsible for bringing in something like 10% of the university's annual income. <clears throat> this included funding bids, very importantly, to support the network of hope, that is, a widening participation initiative. He was also instrumental in bringing in something in the region of six million pounds to support the development of what is now the creative campus in Everton. After completing an MBA in 2000, Ian was appointed head of the business school and then faculty dean. In 2006, he was promoted to pro vice chancellor of operations and over the past 11 years has had senior management responsibility for many of the university's major operational functions, from estates and IT services to finance and catering. More recently, he has also managed, managed health sciences, and since 2016 has acted as head of department or head of school for the Liverpool Hope Business School. Professor van der Waale has been external examiner for both undergraduate and postgraduate business programs at six universities in the UK, and has supervised and examined a number of PhD students. He's also acted as a consultant to the Kavala City Authority, that is in Greece, advising on the city's rebranding campaign. He has published widely and delivered at numerous conferences, being one of the first to report amino acid oxidization via the gamma amino butyric acid pathway. Ian has visit, written on several, uh, has written a set of three science books uh, for the use in secondary schools, and for the last 15 years has developed a growing portfolio of journal articles. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Marketing, and in that capacity has delivered keynote speeches to regional conferences, and also internationally. He remains a visiting academic at the universities of Lyon and Lille. Professor van der Waale now heads up one of our multidisciplinary research centers at the university, which is entitled SEARCH, that is the Center for Socio-Economic and Applied Research for Change. The center explores social return on investment and other impact measures in the community, and is now, as we've heard, working very closely with Everton in the community, that is Everton Football Club's highly respected charity organization. And so, 
is my pleasure to invite Professor Ian van der Waal to present to us his inaugural lecture on the topic Corporate Social Responsibility for Good or Profit. Thank you, Kenneth, for those uh, uh, kind opening words. Um, and it's uh, a delight to see so many people. A little disconcerting because they're drifting behind me at this point, so I hope you're going to be good. Um, it is a, indeed a, a healthy crowd, and I'm reminded of a, um, a couple of years ago, uh, my wife acquired a, um, a signed copy uh, by Simon Jenkins, A Short History of England. And in there, somewhere in the Middle Ages, it says um, executions were always popular and drew large crowds. So I'm just going to check my ticket and make sure that we're all in the same place for the same reason. This evening we're going to look at corporate social responsibility for good or profit. And uh, hopefully we will cover a range of subjects from biology, psychology, sociology, history, business, economics, some um, geography, a bit of ethics and values, and possibly a mention of faith, education, and hope. Not only is there something for everyone around the room, uh, but I guess a reflection uh, that knowledge is continuum, and we probably do it a disservice uh, by carving it up in the way that we do. So, here we go with uh, corporate social responsibility for good or for profit. And I'm going to do this by framing ourselves uh, a number of questions as we go through. What is it? Let's have a look at a few definitions and see if we can define the difference between corporate social responsibility and social responsibility. Ask the question, why do some individuals have a greater propensity uh, for social responsibility than others? How does individual social responsibility translate into the collective business responsibility? And what are the, the origins and historical landmarks that we should be aware of along the way? What models have been uh, proposed uh, whereby uh, corporate social responsibility will apply in practice? And finally, uh, how do we research this and how do we measure its impact in the community? So probably the best thing to do is to start with a couple of definitions. Uh, the first is a definition which is a kind of pastiche of what you'll find on the web. This is social responsibility. And I say that because there are very few definitions out there of social responsibility. Invariably, uh, they're tied into corporate social responsibility and talk about how people should be acting within a business construct. But there we have it. It's an ethical framework whereby the actions of an individual must benefit the whole society. Just a working definition that we can use uh, to see our way uh, through the maze that follows. Corporate social responsibility has a number of definitions. This is one of the more used, or most used. Uh, this is from the World Business Council. It is the continuing commitment by business to contribute to economic development while improving the quality of life of the workforce and their families, as well as the community and society at large. So we have some ideas then of the definition, and I don't want to unpack that at this point. We just need to have in mind that the two things are different, and hopefully through the lecture uh, we can tease out where those differences are and what they mean uh, in practice. So let's start with a second question on the list. Uh, why do some people have a greater propensity uh, for social responsibility, and indeed others to be socially irresponsible? Uh, where does that lie? Well, uh, if you speak to the biologists, and I'm going to start with the biologists, um, then uh, this is housed in altruistic behavior and cooperative behaviors. And that underlying behavior 
is genetically determined. So, uh, initially then, it was proposed uh, that this is part of a kinship model, whereby those small tribes have interrelated genetic pools, uh, a fact uh, formulated by Haldane in the 1950s, uh, before we actually understood what DNA was and what it did. So, following that, uh, this sees the benefits conferred on family groups, siblings, and closely related uh, family tribes. Uh, if you're a psychologist, you'll take an easier route than this, and you'll simply talk about the seminal work uh, given by Wilson on sociobiology in 1975. This is simply a reciprocal model, whereby I will do you a good turn in your time of need on the basis that I know that I can go to you in my time of need. So this is simply a social uh, interaction of reciprocal behaviors. And finally, if you're a neuropsychologist, uh, you're a physiologist, you'll talk about the feel-good chemicals that come about from social interaction. Uh, in particular, oxytocin, uh, which those, uh, the, uh, the Greek scholars, and I know there's a couple in the room, uh, will tell us means rapid birth. But not only is it associated with rapid birth, it's also one of the main chemicals uh, that's involved in these social interactions. Um, and just as an aside, uh, if you put oxytocin as a nasal spray on male handkerchiefs, uh, then it will raise their generosity by 80%. Females might want to keep that with them at Christmases and birthdays. Um, so, so there we have it. We've, we've got these kind of three ideas uh, that bring together why is it that some people uh, are uh, more socially responsible than others. How does this translate then into business? Well, those three ideas are with us because businesses and organizations are simply formal and informal social um, operations. Uh, they are where we socially interact with each other. And there is then a full range of those feel-good chemicals that are elicited uh, in the brain and bring about motivation in the workplace. From this then, those in leadership positions who carry the genes that make them more socially responsible are more likely to appoint like-minded people. And therefore, culture is generated within the organization. And the old models of carrot and stick, uh, which were uh, postulated by Bentham in the 1860s, have been replaced by more open cultures and where freedom and choice are uh, likely uh, then uh, a more socially responsive uh, organization uh, is found. To understand how this plays out, though, in uh, the, the contemporary business world, uh, we need to stop and understand uh, the landmarks and historical um, positions that have shaped us as we've gone through this. We can start our story because we know that our genes uh, that, that social responsibility is in our genes. And so it is part of human DNA. And it's not surprising then that you go back into any of the ancient cultures and in the religious texts of uh, uh, most of the uh, religions, you will find uh, social responsibility uh, embedded in them. This is an expression of social norms and uh, reinforced uh, and helped to shape society. But for us, I guess the story should start uh, with Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith is often cited as the father of modern capitalism. And in his landmark book, given there an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, uh, he came up with these particular points. He was looking then for a division of labor of free trade, of self-interest, of self-interest and exchange, of limits to the government intervention on free price, giving open support for the free market and the laissez-faire structures that support it. More specifically uh, and explicitly, he pronounced that economic self-interest is typically a more real, reliable path to social welfare improvement and affecting to act 
for the public interest. So, no social responsibility there then. This was very much about open markets. But perhaps we should look a little deeper. Uh, there's two things that we need to bear in mind uh, when we uh, see the name Adam Smith. First, we must remember uh, that he was uh, not an economist. Uh, he was a philosopher. And in his first book on the moral uh, sentiment, theory of moral sentiments, he said, the all-wise author of nature has, in this manner, taught man, and this is bias to males at that point, to respect the sentiments and judgment of his brethren, to be more or less pleased when they approve of his conduct, and to be more or less hurt when they disapprove of it. So Adam Smith believed that all people were guided by an invisible hand, a moral sentiment to do good, which acted as an emotional connection to do the right thing. And he saw it that the businessmen at that time were the backbone of a rapidly developing economy, uh, which we'll come to in a moment. And he was appealing then for open markets and for free trade. Second, we have to remember the political and the economic, and I guess uh, the social environment in which he was writing. Keep 1776 in your minds. Because the 18th century was one of the most turbulent in British history. Uh, we entered this, and I'll digress if you don't mind, into a pretty short history lesson, but it does bring those three kind of dynamics together. Uh, the first, then, um, is that uh, as we entered uh, the uh, 1800s, we'd been in a long and protracted war uh, with France. And even as we entered this by 1720, uh, when Marlborough had won the Battle of Blenheim uh, in 1720, uh, the national debt stood at 50 million. Remember, that's almost 300 years ago as we stand now. Um, by the mid-1760s, after the Seven Year War, it had doubled. Wars are extremely expensive, and so George III was imposing extortionate taxes and levies on goods. We'll return to that uh, shortly. At the same time, the Seven Year War changed the map of the globe, and it's important that we recognize uh, what happened at this point, because it sets the backdrop for Britain and business for the next 250 years, if not longer. It started in 1756, um, and it started when the French uh, encouraged, the, encouraged the Indians uh, to revolt, and thereby they put 146 British in the basement at Fort William, an event that we know as the Black Hole of Calcutta. 123 died. Uh, fortunately, Robert Clive was on hand to raise the militia, which went on to fought, fight at Plassey in 1757, and thereby won India uh, for the British Empire. At exactly the same time, the French had surrounded the 13 New England states from Quebec round to Louisiana. That's your bit of geography uh, for Bill Chambers. Um, so they surrounded them uh, through to uh, Quebec. And we know from uh, our school days uh, that it was James Wolfe who went and pushed them back, uh, fighting the Battle of Abraham's Heights, uh, being killed in that event, but nonetheless uh, defeating uh, the French and winning the Americas uh, for Britain. So by the mid-1760s, Britain had a, an empire and was trading from that empire. At the same time, uh, we must remember uh, that the uh, government was still imposing uh, heavy uh, taxes. So luxury goods were being taxed. And in 1773, the Americans revolted. They tipped the tea, on which there's a high duty, into the harbor at Boston, the Boston Tea Party. And that signaled uh, the American War of Independence uh, in 1775. So Adam Smith was writing in 1776, appealing for this to stop before we lost any more of our colonies 
and this was a, a serious issue at the time. But at the same time, R. High, uh, Hargreaves, Highs, and others claim uh, to be working uh, on uh, the spinning jenny, which was perfected in 1764. The first one went into Oswald Twizzle Mill. And at the same time, James Watt was busy uh, with Baldwin, his partner, uh, working on the steam engine. And the first one went into Tipton Colliery at the start of the 1770s. So here we were, the hub, a dynamo, lots and lots of imports coming in from around the world for us to put through our mills and through our mines and so on to fuel this growing economy. And so it was then that the Industrial Revolution was born and so cities were growing and doubling in size every 10 years. In 1700 or thereabouts, Liverpool had 4,700 inhabitants. By 1800, there was a quarter of a million. All of the northern towns uh, were doubling, and with it, social chaos followed. The laissez-faire market uh, continued. And, uh, sorry, the Smith's laissez-faire was a call to open trade across the empire in the hope that his theory of moral sentiments would act as a moral compass uh, by addressing these social uh, chaos and uh, uh, difficulties uh, with this growing um, empire. This continued, this free market, a laissez-faire continued throughout the rest of the 18th century and well into the 19th century. In fact, it's encouraged uh, by Darwinian uh, thoughts in a social context of the survival of the fittest uh, brought about by Herbert Spencer on his text on social statics in the 1850s. It prompted the unfettered pursuit of personal opportunity. Social responsibility and responsiveness emerged much more slowly throughout the 19th century. That unfettered optimism and the excitement and the enthusiasm to expand and extend the empire meant that very few businessmen at the time lived up to the expectations of Adam Smith's moral sentiments theory. In fact, it was a pretty shameful time, an empire built on child labor and slavery. The response was slow. The slave trade was abolished in 1807, but it actually continued into the 1830s before it was outlawed. And it wasn't until 1833 that the Factories Act came in. And the Factories Act stopped children under nine working in the factories and the mills. It was another 10 years, nine years, till 1842 before the same occurred in the mines. And the Mine Act stopped children under 10 in England and Wales. And we had to wait almost 100 years then after Adam Smith before we see some so socially responsible corporations developing. The first was probably uh, Titus Salt, who built Saltaire at Bradford, a model village at Bradford. And it was followed by George Peabody, a Brit who went to America, made his fortune, and came back and built houses for the poor in London. And then the Lever brothers in 1888 were building Port Sunlight. George Cadbury in 1895 uh, started on Bourneville, and in, 18, uh, and in 1901, uh, Joseph Roundtree uh, was building the same in York. So by 1991, social reform was stuttering very slowly into the 20th century. It wasn't until the 1930s that Theodore Kreps introduced uh, business and social welfare as a program into uh, Stanford University and encourage companies to conduct a social audit and report their social responsibilities. By 1942, Peter Drucker, in his second book, The Future of Industrial Man, proposed a social dimension to business in addition to the economic role. And by the early 50s, uh, Bowden was talking of corporate actions, which are desirable in the terms of the objectives and values of our society. 
we can begin to see the growth of social responsibility, working collectively on businesses and on business decisions as it gained momentum through the 20th century. After the war, there was increasing optimism uh, by the Attlee uh, government that brought about its welfare reforms, national insurance, national assurance, and national health. And so by 1947, the state's role had been clarified in providing the social needs for its people. Little changed then until the 1970s and 1980s when a more informed view of the socio-economic landscape emerged and with it a number of theoretical models. We will not go through all of those theoretical models but probably uh, one of the, the, the usual ones that you will see in uh, academic uh, texts is this by Carroll. Carroll gives us four layers. Those four layers reflect the importance of each layer. So, first and foremost, be economical, be profitable, be legal, obey the law, be ethical, do the right thing. And then, be philanthropic, but that was a, a discretionary duty at the top. And by the mid-1980s, Freeman was advocating in his book Strategic Management, a stakeholder approach, that businesses were not just beholden to their shareholders, but to a wide range of, sh of stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, customers, suppliers, lenders, the wider society, and in order to, all of which was in order to develop uh, the objectives that stakeholders would support. By 1994, we had Elkington, who proposed the triple bottom line, uh, which was looking at the three Ps and reporting on not simply profit, but planet and people. That was subsequently adopted by a number of multinational companies uh, like Nike, Procter & Gamble, um, and by Tesco's and others. More recently, since the advent of mass media, corporate social responsibility has become increasingly institutionalized. It reflects the ways in which civil society, the media and governments reshape the markets and reinforce the social responsibilities. Since then, a number of models have emerged and a number of terminologies with them. That will probably keep you going then for the next few minutes and I'll sit and let you read it. We don't have to take all of this away with us. Um, but we do need to pick out one or two of the main contenders there. We will see that, and this does shine a light, you can see it here on this side, that Bacan in 2004 gave a terminology to this CSR spectrum. I've tried to bring it all onto one page. These are kind of different views from different people. And the construct here is to look at those academic thoughts which range on the left-hand side from insincere. In other words, corporate social responsibility can be insincere. Over to the right-hand side, where it is sincere, where it is moralistic, and we'll look at the steps along the way. But if we start with the insincere, there are those uh, such as Freeman and the actor uh, who say that uh, the reporting of CSR is simply a smokescreen. It obfuscates what the businesses are doing underneath and uh, takes your eye off the game. They propose that we stop reporting anything on uh, corporate social responsibility. And then we have to stop with the next one, uh, Milton Friedman. In Milton Friedman in 1962 uh, made the following statement. He said, Few trends, I'm going to have to read it because I haven't written it, few trends could so thoroughly undermine the very foundations of our free society as the acceptance by corporate officials of a social responsibility other than to make as much money for their stockholders as possible. Friedman's standpoint is not easily dismissed, not least because he won a Nobel Prize in 1976 uh, for economics. He was the advisor to the Nixon 
and Reagan administrations and had a profound effect on Thatcherite um, policies. At the same time, we need to recognize uh, that this was said at the height of the Cold War, where the Western dogma needed to be clearly and unequivocally stated as a capitalist paradigm. However, Friedman continued to state this uh, until the year before his death in 2006, which is a bit more difficult to explain. So how do we reconcile Friedman's influential, highly respected views uh, with our understanding of social responsibility? Well, the notion of corporate officials having a single duty to make profits for their stockholders is based firmly in deontological ethics. Deontological ethics are the ethics of obligation and duty. And so Friedman sees this as a one single duty. It's the proper and only legitimate use of corporate profits. It's a powerful argument, particularly given that he goes on to say that the corporate officials would divert those funds, divert the profits towards their own uh, pet causes. Instead, Friedman maintains that the company should pay its taxes in full and then allow the elected government to distribute the wealth according to democratically defined principles. This is the only fair means of corporate responsibility. So, difficult to uh, argue against, but there's been much ethical debate, uh, largely focused on what's seen as a fundamental inconsistency between the deontological ethic of doing one's duty, irrespective of the consequence. So it's a non-consequential ethic. On the other hand, of making profit at whatever the cost. This is incongruent uh, since it demonstrates a consequential ethic, whereby the end justifies the means. Doubtless that ethical debate will remain, but we do need to take it on board as we think through our CSR spectrum. So as we move along and looking particularly at, at this point uh, along the bottom of Windsor in 2006, because Windsor has it that the vast majority of our CSR spectrum is about economics, it's about corporate citizenship, it's about instrumentalism and using CSR uh, for strategic purposes. And indeed, uh, we've seen uh, Michael Porter, uh, a business guru, uh, in every textbook uh, that our undergraduates and postgraduates read, uh, together with Mark Pro Kramer, advocating the competitive advantage of cor corporate philanthropy. So taking that very, very top edge of Carroll's pyramid and saying that's going to be used uh, for uh, corporate means uh, to benefit uh, the reputation to manage risk and uh, increase profit. If we move within the same area on that graph to Kotler and Lee, who wrote this text, um, which is Corporate Social Responsibility, they have a chapter in there called Why Do Good? And those are the bullet points that they give you in that chapter. Why do good? Here's their reasoning. It increases sales, you can read it. Increases sales, strengthens the brand, enhances the corporate image and clout. It increases your ability to attract people. Decreases the operating costs. It increases the appeal to investors and financial analysts. It seems to me though, that doing good is not on the list. We're not doing any of that because one of those outcomes might be to do good. We're doing good simply because it's good business to do good. And good business is about strategically managing your reputation and your profits. Many organizations then are in this area of using um, the political and strategic corporate social responsibility. Moving further to the right, uh, we encounter Freeman's stakeholder approach again, which acknowledges business and those wider stakeholders that we mentioned. 
the triple bottom line is somewhere along that edge. It's still probably being used as a strategic tool. It's still a reporting tool that if you remember, Freeman says we should abandon. So we have to then move over to the far right into the moralism and moralistic ground, uh, which is given by Carroll and Buchholz. Um, and their notion then is that this is the sincere form of corporate social responsibility. And we need to look for companies that are acting at this end. Well, there are those to the far right who have deliberately set themselves up as ideal social responsible businesses. They're there to target specifically the CSR market. They're there, if you go on their websites, it is all about what they're doing for the good, such as the body shop, Ben and Jerry's, Innocent Drinks. We can name several others. But interestingly, those three mentioned have all been taken over by multinationals. The body shop went to L'Oreal and uh, they're now trying to sell it after 10 years of falling profits. Ben and Jerry's have gone to Unilever. They make Walls ice cream at a profit. And Innocent Drinks went to Coca-Cola. It seems then that being a CSR or focusing on the CSR market only is no guarantee of business success. And part of that is probably because many of the consumers and customers have been disillusioned uh, by the level and scale of corporate irresponsibility over the years. The very brands that we believe have, been, uh, have a, a corporate uh, responsibility, the very brands uh, that we have trusted. And over the years then, we've witnessed a number of corporate scandals. There's been some major ones, of course. Uh, we've got Bearings and the Nick Leeson scandal, uh, where uh, he hid 827 million pounds worth of losses. Enron's accounting scandal and the subsequent cover-up uh, by Arthur Anderson, uh, which lead, led to the fall of what was the fourth largest uh, group of auditors in America. Uh, with 60,000 jobs worldwide lost. But then, of course, we lost Lehman Brothers, uh, Northern Rock, Bear Stearns, uh, RBS, all of which triggered uh, the 2008 World Recession. So corporate social responsibility, which each of those claimed, they didn't live up to the messages that they give and were clearly corporately irresponsible. But we don't have to wait for the big ones. We can see them day by day. They're there almost every day that we turn our televisions on. And we won't go through those necessarily, but we will all be aware of the Volkswagen uh, CO2 emissions scandal in 2015. But did we know that Mitsubishi and Renault are under investigation as well as we sit here now? ExxonMobil, they did not disclose, in fact, they countered their own research on climate change. They denied it uh, publicly. FIFA, corruption, Toshiba, accounting scandals that led to the resignation of the chief executive, paying less than the minimum wage there in Sports Direct, Tesco's 2015 horse, horse meat scandal. If we go into this year, uh, we lost uh, four of their uh, directors of finance in an accounting scandal. Yahoo uh, put um, uh, secret software uh, and spyware uh, for the American government onto Yahoo. BHS, their sale, and then the pension scandal that followed. And yesterday, I put on British Airways uh, for their uh, disastrous uh, IT and uh, disastrous way in which uh, they've responded to it uh, with their public front. And so it's not surprising then that we see headlines like this in the Telegraph. Corporate social responsibility has become a racket and a dangerous one. And then it goes on to tell us about the Volkswagen scandal, which uses CSR to allow companies to parade their virtue and look good 
while international standards, uh, internal standards are allowed to slip. So at the end of this, we ask the question, uh, who should we trust? Where are the sincere organizations and where should we look for them? And on this particular uh, slide, what I've tried to do is separate the two dimensions and see if we can tease out the difference between corporate social responsibility and socially responsible organizations. If we can identify where they are, then we can perhaps see where CSR is not a profiteering or reputational drive. And so, again, if you look on the horizontal, we've got the economic benefits. And so as we move along there, we are looking at increased profits. We've got the fundamentalism of uh, Friedman. So Friedman doesn't want to make any social benefits. So he, he doesn't even appear above the line of social benefits. Yeah? We've then got social corporatism and those strategic legal, and then following that, we've got social institutions which are being ethically strategic in their operation. And so we move then into those moralistic ones. And again, they form on our uh, two dimensions. Social benefits increasing uh, vertically. And somewhere along there, we've got things like charity shops. They're in it, not for the profit, but to serve the communities uh, where they trade. Profit would be nice, but that's not what they're about. Social enterprises probably appear there as well. Profit would be nice, but they're more high, they're higher because they're looking at those social benefits. We've got fair trade and body shop who are out to make the profit as well as do the good. So where are we looking? Well, we're looking in the left hand top corner. These are those businesses where there's a clear distinction between the making of profit and being socially responsible organizations. We've got to look for that where the social good is not linked to the business, where doing good has little impact on the bottom line, but is nonetheless seen as an absolutely integral part of the business itself. And even though this may enhance the organization's reputation, it's got little effect on the business itself. So the business is in it for good and not uh, for profit. It's fair to say that if we go onto the websites, we can find uh, a number of uh, league tables that look at those corporately, uh, corporate uh, social responsible organization. But we're looking for those that are socially responsible organizations. And within that then, that brings me uh, to Everton in the community. Everton in the community has established itself a number of pillars in the community which drive forward an ambition social agenda. It includes employment, education and training, youth engagement, health and well-being, sport development, community and business development, the Everton Free School and Sixth Form College. And it's got a clear concern for the community that surrounds it. And although those activities are likely uh, to increase fan loyalty, they're likely to increase passion for the club, the people's club. But it's unlikely to actually increase ticket sales on the door. And so there's a divorce between making the profit on the business and actually building a business and a charity which is focused on the community. Our question then from what is the role then of the Everton Chair of Social Responsibility? My role here is to lead SEARCH, the Socioeconomic and Applied Research for Change Research Centre. And as you've heard from Professor Newport, that brings together uh, academics from across the faculties to work on a number of those pillars that we see. There are out there a number of uh, social metrics that we can use, so-called social value calculators. 
I'm not going to go through all of those this evening, um, but we might want to just stop and look at the first uh, couple on there. This is the uh, local multiplier three and the social return on investment. Both of these were formulated in, in round about two, 2008, 2009 uh, by the New Economic Foundation. Uh, the latter of them uh, was subsequently uh, put to the cabinet office and has become the standard way uh, in which uh, you measure the social impact of organizations and businesses. Some of the metrics, uh, such as uh, the local multiplier three, uh, lead to ratios. They measure, for instance, the amount of income invested in the local community, and then how much of that money is then reinvested and recycled in that community. So if you came with a ratio of one to 1 1.6, it would say for every 10 pound you spent, uh, the organization or the social investment in the local community is worth 16 pound. The uh, social uh, return on uh, investment methodology is more complex, uh, but nonetheless uh, similar. It looks at this at a higher level, takes any one of those pillars and tries to unpack that, uh, putting proxies against that in terms of costs. For instance, we might take a simple intervention where a disaffected youth, young person with a growing criminal record is encouraged to join one of Everton in the community's training classes, whereby they re-engage uh, with society and uh, get a, a job. It should be possible then to measure the economic value in terms of the saving in police time, court time, probation time, and the like. So we hope to be applying these me measures and gain greater insights into which of these projects are delivering the most positive benefits and which might require strengthening or those uh, which might have run their course. Needless to say, we're extremely excited by this research and look forward to further collaboration uh, with Everton Football Club. And so uh, we come to the end of this lecture. Um, I will say some thank yous at the end of this, but in terms of the lecture, we've rehearsed the biological and socio-psychological uh, antecedents of CSR. We've seen how that translates into business, trace the history and political and economic factors that help shape it. We've explored some of the ethical drivers and more recent advances in CSR theory in response to globalization and mass media. We've noticed the skepticism in CSR developments, and we've seen how CSR actions have been obfuscated within the wider company strategic goals. We've noted too that CSR does not prevent corporate social irresponsibility in some of our most respected brands. We have, however, identified socially responsible companies in which the strategic link between doing good and any other business motive is much less apparent, and where the good is seen to be an integral part of community involvement for the betterment of society. We've outlined some methods uh, that we intend to use to measure the socio-economic impacts of such organizations and establish search as a research center, uh, which is working with Everton in the community to explore and analyze the impacts of their community projects. And that leaves me then uh, to say a number of thanks around the room, which I should probably have done at the very start. Um, thank you for your kind attention. I'm delighted to see so many people with us uh, this evening. Um, I'd like to give special thanks to uh, the Vice-Chancellor um, for conferring uh, this um, honour upon me. It really is a very proud uh, honour uh, to be uh, the Professor of Social Responsibility. To Professor Barrett Baxendale and Everton uh, for bringing uh, the two together uh, with Liverpool Hope and forging uh, this partnership. Uh, thank you to all colleagues, uh, both past and present, uh, for your support and for being with me uh, this evening. It's uh, been a, a really good turnout. And uh, finally, thanks to uh, my wife, uh, Linda, 
uh, who's uh, been a supporter uh, for what will be uh, 40 years uh, in uh, August. I did get it right, in August. Um, I can see this oxytocin nasal spray coming into effect anytime soon. Um, she describes me uh, as a, a workaholic, and I guess that's a, a pretty serious addiction along with the rest. Uh, so she's done remarkably well uh, to stick with it that long. And I'm really thankful that uh, Sarah's come along to support her. Uh, Sarah's expecting her baby in uh, July the 14th. That will be the first grandchild. Uh, so these are indeed uh, very happy days. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at Liverpool Hope, it gives me great pleasure to thank Professor Ian van der Waal for his uh, fascinating and insightful inaugural professorial lecture. In tonight's lecture, he has traced the origins and the development of the concepts of social responsibility and corporate social responsibility considering the ideas of Adam Smith and looking specific at developments in the post-war business world, including in the United States and Europe. He's highlighted to us the diversity of views that exist around the importance of CSR. Today, corporate social responsibility is a key aspect of many businesses, which are required to demonstrate their commitments to social responsibility. Indeed, one of my colleagues this morning reminded me of the importance of that on accounting terms. He has indeed given us an insight that is very valuable, and I think we now know more about what corporate social responsibility constitutes. He suggests in his conclusions that it's doing good as part of the corporate social responsibility should indeed often be divorced from the profit motive of companies suggesting that the need to achieve the latter must be seen as a separate motive. This is clearly important for us to think about. Corporate social responsibility is extremely important in an age where the level of public trust in large multinational corporations, whether banks, manufacturers, or other industries, would seem to be at an all-time low. The public are very aware that some of the more well-known companies have behaved in ways that seem far removed from acting in the public interest and have sought to hide wrongdoing, conceal their mistakes, and indeed pursue aggressive tax avoidance policies. I suspect many of these companies are on the tip of our tongues tonight. It is then little wonder that there's limited trust in notions of corporate social responsibility and the motives of such corporations. It's also the case that governments in many developed and developing countries have done little to build public confidence and support, often being seen as in league with large corporations whose business ethics have sometimes been questionable. Nevertheless, historically, business and corporate leaders have had a long tradition of helping others and acting in philanthropic and socially responsive ways. As we look around a city such as Liverpool, much of our physical environment, our parks and our public buildings owe much to the class of 18th and 19th century business people who bequeathed a rich heritage to the city and indeed to the nation. The notion of social responsibility was probably not commonly understood by such men and women, and their motives may indeed be questionable in some instances, possibly representing the moralistic values of the Victorian age. Yet today, economic liberalism and corporate social responsibility may seem uneasy bedfellows, I think as Professor Van der Waal has indicated. Yet in Britain, America and elsewhere, there are business leaders who have the vision, commitment and interest in, in acting in ways that are committed to sustainable economic development and social justice 
which generates significant social capital for societies. The 2008 financial and economic crisis, which led many governments in Europe to pursue austerity measures, had also triggered a public backlash, led to the rise of populism, and indeed some might claim extremism on the left and right of the political divide. This has led some in quarters, in some people, to think about a reassessment and a questioning of the dominance of economic liberalism and raising interesting questions for business and political leaders, social scientists and the public about what alternative models and ways of thinking about the world might be considered. I think for us in Liverpool Hope and in the context of the city of Liverpool and our involvement with our partner institutions, social responsibility and social justice are extremely important in our mission and values. And we share that with many of the partners with whom we work, including most importantly tonight, Everton in the community. We are then in many ways seeking to do good together. We are seeking to influence the world around us and make it a better place. The hope Everton in the Community Partnership provides such a context for examining and thinking about how two socially responsible organizations can play a role in their local communities, contribute to improving the lives of those around us, and act as agents for social and economic regeneration, which is possibly most important for us in this city. Professor Van der Waal, in his lecture, has talked to us about Hope and Everton in the Community Partnership, including about the role of our research center, SEARCH. But I'd like to acknowledge the importance that our leaders in our respective organizations have played in being willing to support such initiatives, both now and indeed over some time. The role that individuals can play in supporting such initiatives is extremely important and makes a significant difference in what can be achieved. I think, like Professor Van der Waal, I'd like to acknowledge considerably the support of Professor Denise Barrett-Baxendale. Thank you. I'd like to support also Jim Keaton for all his work, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Gerald Pillay, and indeed, some of my colleagues over the years who've contributed to these initiatives, and in particular, Martin Carey, the former head of the business school, and has played a significant role both in its development and in that of hope. And finally, Professor Van der Waal, for all the contribution he's made over many years, as Professor Newport highlighted earlier. This is important as the future of the city depends on leadership. Developing local and global connections, as well as building trust and confidence amongst its citizens. And I can't underline the importance of the latter, trust and confidence amongst people. As I come to a close, I'd like to thank Professor Van der Waal for his continuing contribution to HOPE. Uh, we certainly had a productive partnership working together, and I look forward to further cooperation into the future. So thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight. Ian, uh, Ian and I spend many, many hours in the week in various roles, certainly at meetings. But it's always good to, for the first time I sat down to listen to a whole lecture given by Ian. And what an erudite magisterial lecture it was, Ian. It's good to hear your views on such an important topic. And thank you for abs absorbing, for an absorbing hour. And thank you also for your hard work and the contribution you make to the university, which both my colleagues, PVC, Professor Newport and Dean uh, Nicholas Reese have underlined. Congratulations and um, thank you very much for the lecture. Thank you all for coming. It is a little memento that we give our inaugural professor. If you'll come forward um, in and receive this from the university, it at least puts a date on it and remembers the topic. Thank you very much. Very good evening to you all.